Welcome to the program today. My name is Mauna Gonzalez here with Derek Gilbert through Skype. Welcome, Derek. It's an honor to be here, Mondo. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you in Colorado Springs. Yeah, we're we're getting ready. Uh, you know, kind of building up for the for the conference. And um, what we want to reminding people is that we have over 800 people coming, 25 speakers. It's going to be awesome. But if you want to, you can go to prophecywatchers.com. You can scroll down to the banner and participate through our streaming option. We're going to have every every session uh, as well as some other goodies in there. So we invite people to check that out. But Derek, you're going to be speaking twice at the conference and uh, kind of give us some, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what are the two topics you're going to be discussing? Well, the first one is called Destroying the Destroyer, the Mount of Olives, Mount Hermon connection. And this is really a subset of a topic that I cover in my new book, The Second Coming of Saturn. I think most of your viewers are probably familiar with the importance of Mount Hermon, at least insofar as the, uh, the Genesis 6 narrative is concerned. But uh, it was a really important place for the pagans around ancient Israel as well. From uh, ancient times back, e even as far as the Sumerian period, they understood that there was something special spiritually about Mount Hermon. And, uh, you know, in our 21st century world, we kind of forget that uh, they didn't have air travel or even automobiles back then, if you were going to go from ancient Sumer to Mount Hermon, you were talking about a three or four month journey. And yet they knew there was something about that mountain that was the, the secret dwelling of the Anunnaki back in the day. What, but why, why should this matter to us as Christians? I mean, you and I both have an interest in the ancient Near East and uh, archaeology, but why does it matter to Christians? It's because it mattered to Jesus Christ. It mattered to him. It was at the base of Mount Hermon that he declared his divinity. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for this has not been revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. When Peter said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Yet why did Jesus do it there? He chose that location specifically. So I'll talk about that. Of course, then six days later, he climbed a very high mountain, which uh, the only very high mountain near Caesarea Philippi is Mount Hermon. He was transfigured into a being of light, which is the spiritual equivalent of sending a flare mm -hmm. into the uh, unseen realm and saying, okay, here I am. And Get then he ready. went to Jerusalem, but he spent the last week of his life dividing his time between the Temple Mount, which was God's Mount of Assembly, is God's Mount of Assembly, and the Mount of Olives. And I'll explain why that is significant, both historically and prophetically. It was, again, another message into the spirit realm to the entity that is described in Revelation 9 as the destroyer. And I'll track his career through history. Again, that's all in my book, The Second Coming of Saturn. Uh, my second talk is about Gog and Magog, which is uh, a prophecy that uh, Christians and Jews have been arguing over for the last 2,600 years, pretty much. Um, I think there is a very insidious deception that is about to be worked. Uh, it's a little bit of a different take on the Gog-Magog conflict. Might ruffle a couple of feathers, but um, I'm trying to interpret it the way I read it. Um, mm -hmm. We, I think, tend to forget that uh, the prophecy of Ezekiel had to make sense in Ezekiel's day, the 6th century BC. So how would his readers have interpreted that prophecy? And what's the most likely scenario? Uh, as to the way it unfolds in, well, whether it's the 21st century or whenever in the future, who are the players and uh, what is the most likely scenario? Uh, so we'll talk about uh, Gog of Magog's diabolical double cross. You know, we were, uh, Tyler and I, we were at uh, Alberino's conference. One of the things that I had asked him, you know, was we talked about the gospel and I just said, you know, what's your thoughts on all these things, you know, as it relates to all these other ancillary topics? And he said, you know, Mondo, I could be wrong on all of them. He goes, I'm not wrong on the gospel, but we have the freedom with these other things to, to conjecture and to speculate and to contribute and to think, you know, ancient ways and, and you know, whether it's, you know, aliens or UFOs, but versus, you know, you and I know, we, we done a lot of study in the ancient Near East where you see, see these things. I think as Christians, uh, we, whether we agree or not, it's irrelevant in the sense uh, as to these other issues. But I love hearing all p perspectives to think, oh, you know, that's an interesting insight. Or there, I think so, so often in these, some of these other subjects or these secondary subjects, we can become dogmatic 
and, um, and, and traditional in some of these things. And I, th I think that's unfortunate. We need to keep our minds opened. Again, you're not presenting a different Jesus, but hey, right. hey, here's a different scenario about this secondary or tertiary topic. It's like, hey, let's hear it. You know, let, let's see what's going on, especially as, as you do often in the context of the ancient Near East. Yeah, we love Tim Albarino and his out-of-the-box thinking. Mm -hmm. I just think it's unfair that somebody who also is uh, an explorer who uh, cuts his way through the jungles of Peru with a machete can also write so well. That's yeah. not fair. <laughs> so I can write fairly well, but you're not going to find me going out into the yeah. jungles of Peru or digging into, a, say, a, a, a cave in Qumran looking for a scroll. Mm -hmm. I'll read the reports from the archaeologists afterwards and bless them and pray for them and support yeah. their work. <laughs> but, uh, but Tim is definitely an out-of-the-box thinker, and his approach to this is is exactly right. The apostles who had learned from Jesus directly for three and a half years did not understand how he was fulfilling prophecies of the Messiah of the Old Testament, even into Acts chapter one, when they were still thinking that they were waiting for a geopolitical savior. Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now before he was carried up into heaven? So it's not likely we're understanding the prophecies of his return any better than the apostles did the uh, prophecies of his first arrival. What I appreciate too is, I mean, there's a general framework that I think most people, Jesus is coming back, you know, there's probably gonna be a time of trouble. Um, you know, we're pre-trib in our position, but that doesn't mean that we are going to, uh, you know, uh, disregard or not take into consideration other people's viewpoints because I think, I think we all sharpen each other. You know, as we, for this particular prophecy update, there's a couple things that I wanna talk about, which you and I discussed in, a, in another program, but when we think about, uh, the Book of Enoch, or even Mount Hermon, um, you know, we we you, we talk about the Transfiguration that Jesus was at Caesar Philippi. So geographically, we know that it's close. Um, there is an interesting six-day gap between why he was there and when he went up to a high mountain. Um, most you know scholars will say either Hermon or Mount Tabor or even you know Mount Nebo. Some are saying that, but. You know, I tend to think that the best evidence is for, certainly for Mount Hermon, with all of the background there, even if we were to take the book of Enoch out for a moment, um, why do you think that the writers, the, the gospel writers, didn't specify, they specify a lot of other things? Why not? I mean, I know we're conjecturing, but what's your thoughts? My guess, and this is only a guess, is that it would have been so familiar to the readers in the first century that they feel they felt didn't feel the need to specify the very high mountain. I mean, there's only one in the vicinity of Caesarea Philippi. And, you know, to us in the 21st century is that, well, six days later, why did they wait six days to climb the mountain? It may well have taken them six days to climb the mountain. And this is a 9,200 foot mountain that is only passable from about August on because it takes that long for the snow near the summit to melt enough to make travel passable. Now, United Nations has a, uh, an observation post there at the summit, but the fact remains that for whatever reason, Mount Hermon and the, the temple on the summit called uh, Kasser Antar is the highest man-made place of worship on earth. Now, Mount Hermon is not even one of the 100 highest mm -hmm. mountains on earth, and yet that, that temple that was uh, found, uh, well, the, the locals have known about it, but Westerners didn't rediscover it again until the 19th century, uh, is the highest man-made place of worship on the planet. There is something significant about Mount Hermon, and my view is that it was probably so well known in the first century, they didn't feel the need to mention it. Just like today, an American says, the president, we know who we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you know, you look as well, I think the, the idea of, a, of an exceedingly high mountain um, is certainly there's mountains in the Golan up there, that, but um, when you go down south, it, it's hard to imagine a, a, a high mountain, you know, truly like in the, in the southern area or even Mount Tabor. I mean, yeah, compared to the plains, but nothing like Mount Hermon. What's interesting is that uh, they understood there was something spiritual about Mount Hermon, but if you go to the east, the Zagros Mountains and the other mountains in Iran, ancient Persia, there are plenty of mountains over there that are much taller than Mount Hermon. Again, Mount Hermon is not even among the 100 tallest mountains on earth, and yet as far away as ancient Sumer, three or four months journey away, they understood that that was the secret dwelling of the Anunnaki. There's something about that mountain spiritually significant. Mm -hmm. And even though the apostles didn't mention it, the gospel writers didn't mention it by name, there are plenty of references to it in the Old Testament, including some that compare it and contrast it directly with Mount Zion, God's Mount of Assembly. Yeah, no, I think that's really important because, you know, for us, oftentimes as, as Westerners, 
you know, we open the Gospels and we read it from a Western lens. Uh, I mean, that's a lot of my background, even doing Jewish studies for my undergrad, because I had to get out of that Western mind and think of it from a Hebrew perspective or from a Near Eastern perspective. And, and so we, we look at this and we lose out on the, the, just really the context where the, you're like, well, why did I need to write that down? And it's, it's, isn't it obvious? I mean, so it kind of gets over to where we come into the first century, um, you know, before the Dead Sea Scrolls, for the most part, most people looked at Judaism as very monolithic. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls exploded that out of there. You know, I mean, we have Josephus' writings, but even they were like, well, that's, that, that's, is it even true because of the archaeology? It was unknown. But the Dead Sea Scrolls just forever changed the, the facet of first century, second temple period Judaism. So in that, te- in that period, you, you take, for example, the Book of Enoch. I mean, we talk a lot about the Book of Enoch um, we don't believe it's scripture, even though some of the church fathers did, but that we don't today. Uh, so we make a clear distinction there. But yet, why do we, as, as researchers, why do we even take any time with Enoch? We have people write in and they'll ask, you know, this person's asking, you know, you guys are going off the deep end because you're quoting Enoch. We've never quoted it as scripture. So let's talk a little bit about the book of Enoch itself. And maybe it's textual history a little bit, Dead Sea Scrolls certainly, but why do we care? It uh, helps us to understand some of the more uh, 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 weird sections of the Old Testament. And uh, I'm going to quote our friend, Dr. Michael Heiser, who, by the way, his book on this very subject is highly recommended. It's called Reversing Hermon. And he shows how the uh, book of Enoch uh, influenced New Testament theology all through the New Testament. Uh, but as uh, Mike often says, if it's in the Bible and it's weird, it's important. Well, certainly the Genesis 6 narrative and the creation of giants through angels commingling with humans, that's that's really weird. But we don't get very much of it in the Old Testament. And again, I think it's because the uh, prophets knew that that story was so familiar to their readers, they didn't feel the need for uh, plot exposition that we in the 21st century need. Mm -hmm. You know, it would have been like uh, watching a movie where one character just stops and sort of gives like a two or three minute narrative just explaining the backstory of every, when it's already familiar to people who know the story or seen the whatever. Uh, They didn't need to explain it because this was common knowledge to Jews, to Christians in the early church. Uh, It was part of their upbringing. They, they had soaked in this theology. Now, the Book of Enoch, probably written in the Second Temple period, second or third century BC, but it does expand on this, this narrative in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, with the, uh, the commingling of angels and humans, the sons of God. And because of that, and as Sharon and I found in, in the research for our book, Veneration, this is woven all through the Bible. It's been translated out of our English Bibles as uh, references to the Rephaim, Mm -hmm. which were the demonic spirits of the Nephilim destroyed in the flood, are uh, translated as the dead or the shades or the departed. And there's a much different sense uh, when you when you read render the word that way than if you understand that uh, this is who these were, these spirits who still interact with humanity, uh, something that is uh, explicitly described in the book of Enoch. It uh, tells us that uh, this was the origin of demons, that mm-hmm. they are the spirits of the giants who were destroyed in the flood. Ezekiel goes into some detail in this in Ezekiel chapter 32, where we get sort of a description of the geography of Sheol, uh, the, most ex- uh, the, the longest description of the netherworld in the Bible, and mentions that the, the, refer- the, the Rephaim are there, called in that, uh, in that chapter the chiefs of the Gibberim. Mm. Um, so when we, we start reading into the Bible, uh, uh, not reading into the Bible, we draw out of the Bible what the, the worldview of the, the prophets, we understand those sections of the book of First Enoch and the descriptions of uh, the creation of demons, the rebellion on Mount Hermon, described very briefly in Genesis chapter 6, and uh, how it influenced the, the cult of the dead or the veneration of um, the dead which surrounded ancient Israel. Um, this is something that uh, drew the Israelites into the cult worship of Baal Peor on the plains of Moab, which so angered God that he sent a plague that destroyed 24,000 Israelites. Um, Psalm 106 makes it clear that it was the eating of sacrifices offered to the dead that angered God and provoked him to send that plague. 
But 700 years later, the prophet Isaiah was still writing about eating forbidden food amongst the tombs. Um, mm. And uh, so this is something that was, was well known in ancient Israel. We've lost it in our modern world because we've lost the worldview of the prophets and the apostles. No, the book of First Enoch is not uh, scripture, but it was well known to the prophets, to the apostles, to the early church. Um, Jude and Peter both make reference to it in uh, their description of the angels who were in chains and gloomy darkness, the angels who sinned. First uh, Peter 3 calls them the uh, spirits who disobeyed in the days of Noah. Uh, so there are things there that when we begin piecing the evidence together and trying to understand the Bible through the eyes of the apostles and the prophets, Enoch suddenly makes much more sense. There are even some things there that help understand some of the weird stuff, like in Ezekiel 28, the stones of fire. Mm -hmm. When we go into uh, First Enoch, say, uh, chapter 21, I think, where Ezekiel is taken into the netherworld, and he sees burning mountains, and he asks, who are these? And uh, the, uh, the archangel who is conducting him on the tour, Uriel, I believe, uh, says, oh, these are the angels who uh, formerly sinned and uh, will be kept here for, you know, mm -hmm. uh, some long period of, of punishment. So uh, the stones of fire from Ezekiel 28, I've heard uh, <laughs> the theory that this is a representation of the destruction of the planet that formerly occupied the space between Mars and Jupiter. It's the creation of the asteroid. No, 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 no. Burning mountains were supernatural entities that we call mm. angels. And I think this also helps shed some light on what might be coming at us in Revelation chapter 8, the burning mountain thrown into the sea. I think this helps understand Zechariah chapter 4 where uh, the chief god of Mesopotamia called Enlil, and in my new book, The Second Coming of Saturn, I connect him to a number of other entities, Saturn, Kronos, Baal, Haman, et cetera, et cetera. His chief epithet, his main nickname was Great Mountain. And in Zechariah chapter four, God says through the prophet Zechariah, who are you, O Great Mountain? Before Zerubbabel, who was the governor of Judah at that time, you will become a plain. So it's usually explained away as a, a metaphor for a difficult project or an obstacle that must be overcome. I think, thanks to the book of Enoch, we can understand. And no, 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 no. This was a reference, a message at a rebellious fallen angel. And God is saying, you great mountain, you think you're all that. But uh, <laughs> yeah. before my chosen people, you will be made low. Yeah, it's it's amazing to me when you look at... Uh, I did this one time for a Sunday school class where I just took the imagery in Second Peter two four and and then in Jude six where about the the, the gloomy darkness and chains and you're like, you know, where's Peter getting this information? And they're like, you know, I go, can you give me an Old Testament passage? Because if we go to Genesis six, there's no mention of any judgment. There's no mention of gloom or darkness or forever. And so then I simply just went to the book of Enoch, you know, you got it all digital, boom, 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 you bring it out. And I was comparing it and I said, clearly, what is Peter referencing here? I mean, it's crystal clear that the imagery comes right out of the book of Enoch, right into our New Testament. I mean, you know, again, whether he believed that was all 100% inspired, because he, he didn't, at least Peter didn't quote it that way, but um, Jude didn't quote, he quoted, it's interesting the way he phrases, you know, he quoted Enoch without necessarily saying the book of, but, right. you know, and I, that's why I think, as you mentioned, even the Heiser's book uh, at the, in his appendix, he goes through and he shows all the other influences of the pseudepigraphical literature on the New Testament. And of course, if you get the, the uh, Old Testament uh, in the New Testament, uh, th th what's the, uh, G.K. Beale, he was the editor in D.A. Carson, that real thick book, it's done, it's tremendous where you, you look at it, it's, it's a commentary on the New Testament, from, on the Old Testament, but they give you all the Dead Sea Scroll, they give you Old Testament information, they give you the, 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 the Second Temple period, you're like, wow, there's all these things that are behind the scenes, which again, aren't necessarily scripture, but it puts us in that time frame to understand what the writers were thinking. Right, right. And what's really amazing is when you realize that even the pagans around ancient Israel knew the story. In 1869, Sharon discovered this as she was researching characters, historical characters, for her uh, series of supernatural thrillers, the Red Wing Saga. She was looking up a gentleman by the name of Charles Warren, who your viewers may be oh. familiar with, as the discoverer of Warren's shaft 
the shaft that David's general Joab probably climbed to get into Jerusalem and oh, the city of the Jebusites to open the gates and allow him in. But also the uh, fellow who discovered the Misha stela or the Moabite mm -hmm. stone. In September of 1869, he climbed Mount Hermon for the Palestine Exploration Fund and found that temple on the summit that I made reference to. And inside that temple, he found an ancient slab of limestone, four feet high, about 18 inches wide, 12 inches thick. Um, he, he shaved it down to four inches thick, which reduced the weight from six tons to two tons. You got to really want to leave a message badly <laughs> to carry a six ton stone up a 9,000 foot mountain. And uh, with the permission of the, uh, the Ottoman governor in Damascus, mm -hmm. he took it back to, uh, to, to London, where it's now at the British Museum. And it's not on display, we asked when we were there a few years ago. But in archaic Greek, which means this is in the uh, Hel Hellenistic period, possibly prior to the arrival of the Romans, so no older than Alexander the Great, say 4th century BC at the oldest. Some scholars put it as, as late as the Christian era, 2nd century AD. But it's inscribed in Greek, by order of the Most High and Holy God, those who swore an oath proceed from here. Well, a scholar by the name of George W.A. Nicholsburg, who is an expert on the Book of Enoch, says this is clearly a reference to the story of the watchers on Mount Hermon, as described in the book of First Enoch. This was known to the Greeks who inhabited that area. And, uh, you know, going back to the period, the Second Temple period yeah. and the period into the Christian era, perhaps, there was a Greek speaker who knew the story and left this stone on the summit of Mount Hermon inside that temple. So uh, this is not just a Christian thing or a Jewish thing. The pagans knew the story as well. And our friend by the name, uh, friend, uh, Dr. Doug Hamp, Mm -hmm. in uh, his book, Corrupting the Image 2, actually drew some new information out of that tablet that uh, previous scholars had not, showing how there's a reference in that stone that uh, the Most High and Holy God is not talking about the God of the Bible. It's talking about Enlil, or El of the Canaanites, or Dagon of the Philistines. That's who this God was. And that's why in my book, uh, Second Coming of Saturn, I connected to Shemiyaza, the leader of this rebellion of watchers on Mount Hermon. So again, Mount Hermon helps understand the story that's only mentioned briefly in the book of Genesis because, uh, again, this was very familiar to Jews and the early church through about the first 400 years of the, uh, after the resurrection. I mean, even if, we, even if we were to dismiss, or not dismiss, but if, even if we didn't read the New Testament, there's no doubt you, you think about Bashan, you know, the land of the Rephaim, and where, where yes. is that geographically? I mean, there it is. It, it, the whole thing comes down. You know, when you're sitting there at Gilgal Rephaim and you look up and you're in, you're in there, you're in, you're in the, the land e east of the Jordan or really northeast, but you're like, hey, there's Mount Hermon. And it's, it's cool when you do go there at certain times when you can see the little bit of the snow left because then, then it actually shows itself to be much stronger in its appearance. But yes, it, it, it's pretty neat. Um, so let's have a little change of, of topic. We think about here we are, uh, you know, we're coming, relatively speaking, to the end of the age. Um, what are some prophetic trends that Derek Gilbert is looking at as it relates to prophetic end times? You know, what's your thoughts? Well, certainly we're seeing knowledge increasing as uh, was revealed to the prophet Daniel. I think uh, there are things that are coming, uh, not, not just scientific discoveries, but I think things that are coming out of um, uh, archaeologists mm -hmm. who are uh, working in in Israel, uh, I'm sure you know about the uh, the lead tablet, the cursed tablet mm -hmm. that was found uh, in the dump pile from the site of Joshua's altar. That is uh, really new. Uh, there is uh, another little fragment of ceramic called the Lachish Milk Bowl Ostrakhan found at the ancient city of Lachish that ties to the, uh, the, the conquest of Canaan by Joshua and the Israelites. But just the discovery of um, the, the Ugaritic texts, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and things that uh, scholars are now finding in those texts that are helping us to give better context to the world of the apostles and the prophets. I think that uh, could be included in that uh, prophetic fulfillment of knowledge increasing in this day. We have access to information, Mondo, that uh, the great biblical scholars and theologians of years gone by, centuries past, did not have access to context that we did not understand. All of this discussion of the book of Enoch and the cult of the dead around ancient Israel, the veneration of the, the, the ancestors, the Rephaim as the spirits uh, that proceeded from the Nephilim. We've got confirmation now from pagan texts that were not available to previous generations. That's really exciting. Yeah, it's exciting. Now, of course, some of the knowledge that's also coming out is leading to this uh, belief that somehow we will overcome 
death through science, the transhumanist movement, which may lead to the fulfillment in Revelation 9 of those who will seek death, who will seek Thanatos, the Greek god of the dead, but he will flee from him, the rider on the pale horse. Uh, Sharon and I have come to conclude, come to believe that uh, the woman riding the beast in uh, Revelation 17 is uh, Inanna, who is the ancient goddess of Sumer, uh, also known as Ishtar Astarte in the mm-hmm. Bible, Aphrodite to the Greeks, Venus to the Romans, Queen of Heaven, mm-hmm. uh, mentioned in the Bible, that she was the original gender fluid entity on this earth. There are ancient Sumerian hymns that have been translated that praise her for being able to change men into women and women into men, and her temple servants had to mutilate themselves. Mm. And we are seeing now, just in the last 10 years, this trend that is uh, being facilitated by social media, peer pressure through social media and activists online. Um, I I just talked on uh, Skywatch TV's 5 and 10 daily news commentary about uh, the state of Oregon is now mandating um, feminine hygiene products being placed in every bathroom, regardless of gender, in all of their schools, elementary, middle, high school, uh, because, you know, boys can have their monthly cycle just like girls. Like, wait a minute. No, no, that's not scientifically possible. It's not biologically possible. But this is the spirit of the age, this gender fluid goddess of carnal sex and mindless violence. That's who she was in ancient Sumer. And what is our world filled with today? If it's not real violence, as we're seeing in places like Yemen and Ukraine, it's virtual violence through video games and first-person shooters and things like that. And of course, the idea that you can be whatever gender you choose. I think that is a prophetic fulfillment leading to her emergence for a time as the head of this end times religion of the Antichrist. Um, One big thing that I think is really important, a report this week that 90% of the world's central banks are now actively working on researching or developing what they're calling CBDCs, central bank digital currencies. Now, a good friend of mine who uh, is in Roswell, New Mexico, interestingly enough, uh, Guy Malone, who coordinated some very influential and uh, groundbreaking conferences on on the Bible and UFOs years ago in Roswell, which took some courage. Mm -hmm. Uh, He is now uh, an editor for Bitcoin Magazine. Oh, wow. And he did. He did a presentation for our last virtual conference at Skywatch TV on uh, the topic of whether Bitcoin is the mark of the beast. And his conclusion was, no, it's not. But he uh, suggested that these central bank digital currencies are the template on which the mark will probably be developed. Because with a central bank digital currency, they'll sell it as uh, secure and as convenient because like the credit card commercials, you know, what's in your wallet. You got the person fumbling for cash at the checkout counter, holding up the line. Everybody's getting impatient. Just swipe your card. It'll be so much easier. How much easier will it be to just hold up your hand and have them scan a, uh, a mark and have credits deducted from your account and credited to the, uh, to the vendor. But if a central bank is in charge, if the federal reserve bank or the bank of England or the bank of Europe or whatever has issued that digital currency, you will no longer have any financial privacy as every transaction using that central bank digital currency is routed to and through the government. Not only will they have the, the uh, ability to track all of your purchases, they can also make it impossible to spend your currency mm-hmm. on certain unapproved things, perhaps religious literature or paraphernalia or a religious education or donate to certain unapproved groups, things like that. That, I think, is the direction we're going with the central bank digital currency. Mm -hmm. And I think it's significant that uh, many of these that are in development are targeted for rollout sometime in 2025. So we're getting very, very close to that. Yeah, when you look at the whole crypto world, you know, I actually own a little bit of crypto just for kind of fun. Um, Certainly not getting rich on it by any means, but uh, just kind of more as a hobby. But it, if when you look at in at crypto itself and Bitcoin and others, and you compare that with Revelation 13, they are completely opposite. You know because why? Generally, crypto is decentralized. Well, the Revelation yes. 13 model is 100% centralized and controllable. As you mentioned, programmable currency. I mean, it's insane to think about it. But 
So, but nevertheless, we look at these things, um, the, the digital currencies and, and the centralization that's happening, as well as the, the tyranny, you know, even, you, you know they're not going to, from a, from a governmental perspective, they're not going to want to let go of anything, and they really haven't. You look at the, the integration of the digital passport, so now you have health, but as well, it, it's all digitizing, so you can bring in the currency, you can bring in the ability to go into a store to buy. I mean, you, you, we, we saw a lot of interesting things that I, I think a lot of it is conditioned. We're, are we there yet? No, I don't even think we're necessarily close. But there's no doubt that two years ago, of course, Bitcoin was around, but it, the integration was not there. And now it's, it's not fully realized, but it's well on its way. Yeah. Yeah, we are definitely seeing the uh, trial run uh, of, the, uh, uh, of how the mark will be rolled out. Yeah. And uh, it will be some, something will, will convince people that it's in their best interests to demand a central issuing authority. And uh, we just, uh, you know, as a pre-tribulation believer, the one comfort we take in all this is I don't think we'll be here when that, uh, when that happens. Yeah. But we can certainly use this as a teaching moment for those around us who've not yet come to accept Jesus Christ or the truth of end times prophecy and say, this is how this will look when this gets here. So that someday when it arrives, it, those folks who may have heard these messages will say, hmm, maybe that... Uh, Gonzalez guy wasn't so crazy after all. <laughs> well, Gonzalez and Gilbert, the two G's. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, Derek, appreciate you coming on. Always an honor. Appreciate you watching this prophecy up today. As always, keep watching. We are. Uh, we like to uh, ask as well for prayers. Uh, we know that apart from God, we can do nothing. So appreciate you watching. We'll see you next time.